community know. Uh, we are the state's largest Second Amendment organization, Second Amendment pro-self-defense, pro-hunting organization. Uh, the reality of the situation is that we're actually the state's largest and most active civil rights organization. However, we just happen to be narrowly focused on hunting, uh, the Second Amendment self-defense. Um, we are completely nonpartisan. We don't care about the letter after somebody's name. We found in West Virginia that there are anti-gun Republicans and very pro-gun Democrats. So we really don't care what party you align with. We care whether you support our rights or not. Uh, and that's very important and it's been critical to our success as an organization that we always remain nonpartisan. We are all volunteer. It's a running joke around here that they double my and the board of directors salary every year. So twice nothing is still nothing. Uh, I appreciate the pay raise. Um, but uh, yeah, not nobody gets paid in this organization. Everybody that you see working fairs, the board of directors, everyone is a volunteer. They're doing it because they believe in our rights, they believe in liberty. So that's why we do it. Uh, definitely not for money. So, uh, talk a little bit about some of our successes that we've had in the past. Before I do that, uh, it's important to understand that we actually brought the national level to us. We have strong support from the NRA now. In fact, both of our NRA ILA reps are WBCDL members. So we have, we have, you know, the backing of the 800-pound gorilla in Washington, uh, and serious and strong backing. Um, one of the ILA reps is here. He's hiding back here in the back. Our Tom, stand up. Yeah. Okay, most of you guys know Art. Art's been the vice president of the WBCDL for years before moving up to the NRA. So uh, he's doing good things in other states, kind of spreading, spreading the good work that we've done around the country, uh, which is really good news. Um, so a little background on what we've accomplished uh, in the past, well, going back about four years. And I'm only going to hit the highlights. If you want to see everything that we've done for the Second Amendment, for, for hunting, etc., go to our website and look up our accomplishments page. You guys, trust me, don't want to sit here and listen to every every bill that we've gotten passed. And I will tell you, that's a good problem to have. For me to not have time to lay out all of the good things we've done for West Virginia is a good problem. Um, I'll hit the highlights for you. Because a lot of people, we had a lot of uh, controversy and we had a vicious fight over constitutional carry for the past two years. And a lot of the things that we've done prior to that have gotten lost in the mix. People have short memories, they forget. So I'm going to take this opportunity to remind you of some of the other things that have happened. Uh, one of the biggest issues, you can, some of you guys will remember, back in 2013, it was illegal to carry a loaded firearm in the woods of the state of West Virginia. We had people harassed by law enforcement claiming that the bushes at Cabela's were the woods of the state. So the way it was effectively is that DNR believes they own all of the outside, and if you were carrying a firearm, a loaded firearm without a license, you were in the outside, you were in the woods of the state, you were in violation of the law. Same thing with vehicles. You couldn't open carry a loaded firearm in vehicles. If you had a magazine for a long arm with loaded rounds, that was considered a loaded rifle. We got all of that fixed in 2013. The open carry issues, fixed. The open carry in a vehicle, fixed. Most of that was made moot by constitutional carry, but everything is an incremental step. You'll run into those folks out there who say, we've got to have everything now or nothing. Get that. It took us 30, 40 years to lose all of our rights, and for us to have gotten this much back in the 10 years that the WBCDL has, has been in existence is nothing short of miraculous. And those miracles are the result of you folks doing what you do, coming here, going down to Charleston tomorrow, getting yourselves involved. 
And once they get involved, last year we had uh, it was an election year coming up. I think we had five people stand up that were actively running for our office. And they got their introduction and their realization that they could get involved in politics from this group. They saw what we did. Now, we're single issue. Most of those folks said there were, believe, believe that there were other issues they cared about and could fight for. So they decided to get involved and run for office. Some of them were unsuccessful. Some of them were successful. Some of them are now members of the legislature and they got their start here. Now they're senators and reps, etc. The WBCDL managed to pull these people into the political process and get them involved with the crafting of the laws that govern their lives. Dwight D. Eisenhower made the statement that this is our duty. It's the duty of every American to be a part-time politician. This is the challenge he laid before you. And the fact that you're here tells me you have stepped up to that challenge. You are getting involved. You're making a difference. You're a part-time politician now. You are as much a part of the process Every one of you is as much a part of the process as any senator, any delegate, anyone in the executive. I'll tell you why. When you go and you study poli uh, poli politics, political science, cities all over the state that had different laws and different regulations on deadly weapons and firearms, this is a nightmare for people like us who intend to be law-abiding. It, it is effectively a minefield. When you walk into Huntington and the law's different there, and how would you know? How would you know that it's different in Wheeling, that it's different in Charleston, that it's different in Martinsburg? And trust me, people were getting hemmed up on this. So preemption, we made, we set the groundwork for all the laws to be uniform statewide. And what that means is it's a maximum level of restriction that a municipality can enact. So, for us, now life is a lot easier. We don't have to worry about having to learn all of the little ordinances in every city in the state of West Virginia. We've got one state and one law, and we can keep ourselves out of trouble, right? So that's a pretty huge accomplishment. Um, and that was a big fight. And I will remind you that that fight was won with a Democratic legislature. Democratic leadership, with pro-gun Democrats in leadership. They exist, and some of some of them are our strongest supporters. So uh, it's simply in other states, yeah, this is a partisan issue. It really is. You go to another state, it's a partisan issue. West Virginia is different than any other state in this country on about any issue, and especially ours, especially this one. Um, I think most of you are probably aware of the big fights in 2015 and last year, that whole constitutional carry fight. Uh, I think you all do a round of applause for that one. Uh, I made the statement a few times, and I, it, it's proven to be true more than once. What we do here in West Virginia is affecting the country. And I'll tell you where it started. You guys remember after Sandy Hook, you remember they were spinning up in Washington to strip all our rights. Every piece of the pie they could get, they were spinning up to grab. Who was first out in the streets? Nationwide, it was us outside a federal courthouse in Charleston, West Virginia. We filled the streets. Then we did it again a few weeks later in Martinsburg. Trust me, they were talking about us in Washington, D.C. Believe it. I know for a fact that it's true. So, we, we West Virginians, and the WBCDL were the first in the fight to stem the tide of gun control that was coming after Sandy Hook. So that was our first big in, impact on the national scene here in Little West Virginia. The next was passing constitutional carry and getting it vetoed. We got, we got vetoed. That veto brought so much news and attention to the issue of constitutional carry, we could not have bought 
the, the uh, press that we got off of that. Even though most of it was negative, they, you know, the media tends to hate us, which I'll wear as a badge of honor. But uh, it brought us so much attention, and it brought attention to the issue of constitutional carry. And our argument started getting out. And I have had people contact me from other states this year, in fact, in the past few weeks, where that fight is being replicated. Hey, all those lies that you guys dealt with for the past two years, well, guess what? We're seeing the same ones. And I'm glad you guys fought that fight because I have the answers now. And so we educated a massive part of the country about all the lies that come in opposition to constitutional carry. And what we are seeing is states falling like dominoes on this issue, and they are falling on the side of liberty. And we were another state in that process, and our fight, believe me, was high visibility, far higher, I think, than many other states, which somehow surprises me, because we're just little old West Virginia. We're a population of 1.8 million people. There are cities in America with more, more people than our whole state. But we somehow, the media focused on our fight, and we won. Little Birdie told me that Michael Bloomberg spent $7 million fighting us on constitutional carry in West Virginia. I'm not going to tell you what we spent, but I'm going to tell you right now, it was not $7 million. <laughs> I'm not even sure it would show up on a pie chart next to seven million dollars. <laughs> so, uh, we've been very successful, and that success is affecting the national narrative. Other states are following suit. All the lies about the blood running through parking lots, and all the drug dealers being armed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not working. It's not helping in most of these places. Liberty is contagious, and here you are spreading it just by being here. So, back to preemption. I meant to talk about this a second ago. A lot of people don't realize what that meant. You know that there were cities in West Virginia that had you could buy a one handgun a month roll. You could. You had to have a three-day wait to pick up your handgun. There was a registry of people who had purchased the handguns, their addresses, and the serial numbers of those handguns. You had full city property carry bans. And all of these things are gone, poof, gone away. Still some litigation pending on parts of it with a certain municipality, but uh, we'll see how that goes. So what's going on this year? I'm sure this is uh, the big question on both, most of your minds. I'm going to apologize. Uh, the board of directors has generally played this fairly close to the best. Uh, we do that generally for a single reason. The reason we've been very quiet about our strategy is we don't want to just hand it over to the opposition early and let them spin up. And when you've got somebody that's spending $7 million to fight you, you need to take advantage of every little uh, edge you can get your hold of. So some level of yeah, keeping things quiet uh, has been necessary. But um, what's coming? We are looking, when the WBCDL is analyzing what bills to push, when the, when the leadership is looking at what do we want to push, we take two factors in, in, well, three factors in mind. One, what does our membership want? So you'll see, you know, we issue polls on Facebook. You guys respond. It gives us a feeling of what you want to see. Then we have to weigh that against what is possible. Okay? Well, sometimes the membership wants something that's politically not possible right now. It, it may, it's certainly something that's typically on our agenda, and we'll get to it, but this year maybe not the best time. I'll give you guys a great example of this. There are a couple bills that have already been introduced, and uh, these bills, uh, I call them nullification bills, 
where they say, hey, you're not going to enforce federal law in West Virginia on firearms. Okay, the WVCDO actually supports this on a symbolic basis. We support the symbolism, we support the Tenth Amendment angle of those bills. We have to look at the realities. Let me tell you how the reality of this goes. The minute that bill is passed, and we saw this happen in Kansas this year, the minute that bill is passed, somebody's going to start making machine guns in their garage, and they're going to start selling. Now, who's going to show up at their door? BATFE is going to kick their door in, shoot their dog, and drag them off to jail. And they are going to take them up to one of the regional jails in federal custody, not state. They're going to take them to a federal courthouse, not circuit court. They're going to convict them of federal crimes, and then they are going to put them in a federal prison. By show of hands, who thinks that the West Virginia State Police is going to stack an entry team on the courthouse and go rescue you? I don't see any hands. Because the WVCDL lives in a state of political reality. We need to do what's real and what's possible. And the biggest decision, the biggest factor in our decision of what to push is how many West Virginians are directly affected by the policy change we want to push. And we come up with a couple of answers to that question. We believe that the highest priority based on the numbers of West Virginians affected is employer parking lot protection. West Virginia's largest employers statewide all have policies that say you cannot have a firearm in your vehicle on their property. They'll fire you for it. So, I mean, we're talking all of the hospital systems, the universities, uh, Walmart, another huge employer, all of the big employers, Milan Pharmaceuticals, who, who else is big up north of you? <laughs> yeah, so I mean the, the biggest the biggest employers won't let you even have a firearm in your car. Now we look at that and say, well, okay, that's kind of a property rights thing. But what's the net effect of your employer not letting you keep a firearm in your vehicle? It disarms you all day. That's the net effect. Because are you really going to run errands before you go to work? Go home, put your gun up, come back. Or after work, are you going to run more errands, go out to eat, whatever the case may be, but go home first to pick up your gun, then drive however far it is to wherever you're going. No, nobody's going to do that. They're going to remain unarmed all day because their employer won't let them store a firearm in their car. And that's a public safety issue in my mind. It leaves us, those of us who work in those environments, it leaves us vulnerable all day or it exposes us to being fired with cause. And you, you won't have a, if, if you're fired under those circumstances, you're not going to have a leg to stand on. You're just out of job. And most people will not risk that. Yeah, and unemployment. You lose your unemployment benefits. And that's a nightmare. We've got enough troubles with jobs in West Virginia, well, I better stay on topic here. <laughs> uh, so, uh, parking lot carry is, is a huge priority. It affects a lot of people. Another one, who here has school-age kids in the public school system? Yeah, it's going to be about a third or more of us, all right? So, the next big priority is going to be uh, school drop-off and pickup. I will tell you right now, we are not going to get school care. <coughs> Politically, that is not doable this year. It's on our list, and we'll get there. But right now, we cannot get full school care through our legislature. I'll tell you, pick up and drop off, though, it is going to be really hard for our legislature to say, we won't give you as much freedom as they have in Ohio <laughs> on gun rights. Because in the state of Ohio, as long as they stay in their vehicle, they can go pick up their kids, drop them off, and get out of the vehicle with a gun. But you can have it, you can have it on you in your vehicle. 
And we're looking to replicate that here because it's the same problem. It's the same problem as uh, employer parking lots. You know, it effectively disarms you all day because you have to pick up or drop off your kids. Um, we think that probably both of these have a pretty good chance this year. Uh, so we'll be monitoring. We'll let you guys know. Uh, usually, initially, when the message comes out to you, you'll see, hey, no action required at this time. We're just letting you know what's going on. But if they get kind of lazy about moving our stuff, suddenly we have to turn on the activism machine. That would be you guys. Uh, get you guys involved in the fight. Uh, get things done. Um, another big priority we're looking at, and this is another one of the effective number of West Virginians affected, and plus the WBCDL hold on this, because I honestly had no idea where our membership stood. I really didn't know. It turns out that you guys are overwhelmingly in favor of uh, statewide Sunday hunting. I mean, all of the, I mean, there, there are a few who are not, but by and large, you guys are in favor of statewide Sunday hunting. What's kind of interesting about this bill is, my personal belief is we're probably not going to have to push it too hard. And the reason is, apparently DNR wants it. And DNR wants it bad. Okay. <laughs> we'll help you out. We'll make sure that all these legislators know that we support it. So they're not stepping on anybody's toes when they pass it. Uh, but generally, with uh, DNR behind something like that, and, and bills are already moving this early for it. There's actually going to be a Senate hearing tomorrow on statewide Sunday home. So, uh, um, they, you know, great when there's a hearing on a, a pro gun, pro hunting bill on Lobby Day. I love that. Uh, so, uh, that, that is likely to move. That's pretty much most of our agenda this year. And we'll have some more news on that uh, tomorrow for those of you who can, can be at the Capitol with us uh, at 8. Um, hey, yes. So, WBCDL primarily is in the business of liberty. That's, that's what we're about. And when I'm talking to you guys as a group, I'm always giving you a mixed message, and that's intentional. First, you're here, so I'm thanking you for being here. You're involved. I'm thanking you for being involved. Because I'm going to tell you, the board, me, anybody in this organization other than you guys, we, we can't do anything. We can't get anything done in this state without you guys. So thank you for being a involved. Then when I'm done with that, I turn around and I lay I lay the reality on you, the charge on you. The advancement of liberty is your responsibility. It's not mine. I can't do it. It's impossible for Keith Morgan, Keith Campbell, Ian Masters, wherever he wants. It is impossible for the board of directors to do it. The only people that can advance liberty are the people sitting in this room and all the people in the rest of that press, just of this restaurant who are not paying attention. Right? So, thanks, and I'm laying the charge on you. It's you that has to spread it. Now, believe me when I tell you that liberty is contagious. It spreads on its own almost. You just have to nudge it along a little bit. You've got to talk to people got to bring friends to things like this. You've got to bring your friends to lobby day. You've got to bring them out. Get them involved. Let them see who and what we are and how we do it. And if you do that, you can see the exponential spread of both the mindset of liberty and the notion, hey, I can get involved in things. I'll tell you right now, if you guys individually are getting involved in other issues, even if I disagree with you, great, outstanding, do it, get involved. And uh, if we're the doorway for more people to do that, then, man, we are really being successful. Uh, another way to do that, we've got 
members in this room that have volunteered at fairs, that have been at the state fair, that have been at these little, little county fairs here and there. It is unbelievable the impact that that work has. A lot of you guys, I'm telling you, it can be a real mixed bag at these fairs. Uh, yeah, you will meet some interesting characters, uh, and some of them will hate you. Uh, some of them will, some of them will love you, and most of them, though, you will see them give you that kind of stink eye of West Virginia skepticism. I don't know who you are, and I don't know what you're about. You sound like a militia. You know, um, yeah, obviously we're not a militia, we're a lobbying organization, but they don't get that. In marketing, there's a rule of, of three that I've that I found in this organization to actually be true. On their third contact with something they believe might be positive, they'll start to investigate. So if they saw a news article that involved the WBCDL, there's one. They walked by a banner at a fair. There's two. They ran into a guy in one of these black shirts at a gas station and wound up having a conversation about what's that shirt. There's three. On that third time, usually they'll head out to the website and start reading. Figure out what we are, what we do. One of the things I'll tell you guys is you work these fairs, push the Facebook group because there is no quicker way for people to understand who we are and how we operate than that Facebook group. You guys may have noticed that we kind of moderate that group with a pretty heavy hand. We have to. That is our front office and the image that we show to the world. And we have to be very protective of that. Because when you guys are working a fair, especially a big fair, it's hilarious. Because I've been at work all day or something, and I, I come back because I'm not at that particular fair. I come back and I look, and it's Facebook mod. 87 people want to join this group. <laughs> so I'm sitting there going, all right, there's a fair over at such and such today. People are coming to see what we are and what we do. So when you're standing there and that guy's looking at you as a fair, kind of like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll check you guys out. And he, takes a business card, and you're pretty sure I'm never going to hear from that guy again. He's going home and looking us up. It happens. And I'll tell you right now, at those fairs, it is hilarious. With the state fair, where's Wes? Right yeah. Women. Women come and want to know what we are doing and who we are more than the men. I have seen their man walk away, and they're standing there working up all the info they can get. It's the, it's the biggest growing dem demographic for Cary in the country, and I absolutely want to support that. I have been on a mission since about 2003, 2004. I've been so sick of the chauvinism and gun culture. The alienation of half of our voting base, it has made me want to physically choke people in gun stores. <laughs> The fact that I refrain from choking them is sort of miraculous. I'm maybe have a temper sometimes. Oh. <clears throat> the good news on that front is it is getting so much better. So much better. And here in West Virginia, it is really improving. Um, so when you guys are working these fairs and those, and those women are walking by, see, I, I have a methodology. I look for things. Man, who do I want to talk to? I look for the little clip sticking out of the pocket, because yeah, you know what that is. I look for a shirt that's not tucked in, because you know why it's not tucked in. Right. So, so I kind of target those people, the, the American flag hat, the Oakley sunglasses. Those, that's low-hanging fruit right there. But the women, when you bring them in and engage them, and they find out that West Virginia's gun culture and West Virginia's uh, shooters are not chauvinistic pigs. Oh man, do we get some strong supporters because when they buy in, they buy in. They are all for it. It's, I'm a bit of a feminist. I am all about empowering women. And the ultimate empowerment of women is allowing them the ability to defend their own life.
one more of that. All right, my phone turned off, so I lost my notes here. Some of you guys have seen some of the cool swag, right? Cool hoodies. I want to let you guys know how the swag operation in the WVCDL works, which is to say that mostly it doesn't. And we do that for a reason. The people who run our logistics, all these black t-shirts, the processing of your memberships and payments are loaded enough with work anyway. On top of that, I have personally a real aversion to buying things having those things sit on a shelf waiting for people to come buy them. And the reason I don't like doing that is, uh, I mean, the board can tell you, it has suddenly come up the immediate need to go to the radio, the TV, to run ads in newspapers over this issue or that politician. And I don't want that money that I could use to beat up a politician or push an issue sitting on a shelf somewhere because I cannot pay a TV station in hoodies. They won't take it, I've tried. So, for that reason, you have to watch the store and you have to watch the Facebook group for announcements. Hey, we're putting something on sale. Because we do that, we take all the orders, we close the order window, and then we make a purchase and ship the stuff out. That way we're only spending what we have to and no money is tied up sitting on a shelf somewhere. So, I mean, we get a lot of questions. Where do you get those cool hats Kevin's wearing? Where do you get these cool hoodies? Can I buy something on the store? You go to the store page, up there. Nothing's on sale. That's why. So, wanted you guys to be aware of that. And I, I know WVCDL swag is hot ticket stuff, but we are, we're not a retailer. It's not our thing. Selling stuff is not what we do. We're in the business of advancing liberty. And everything that we do will be tailored to that. So, given that uh, I burned up a lot of time here, I know you, most of you looks like you've eaten. So I'm gonna open the floor for a little while for questions. I don't do this very often, but uh, anybody has any questions on anything WBCDL is doing, what might be coming up? Against my better judgment, here I am. Didn't you? <laughs> Who do we see for business cards? That guy right there, Tom Raines, he will hook you up. Oh, I got some too. Buy the truckload if necessary. <laughs> Anybody else? I'll take advantage of this. Go ahead, Danny. Oh, God, Danny. <laughs> 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 we get a little sneak about the dude's brain pop in the morning? No. <laughs> I'm evil. I'm evil. <laughs> Yeah, that was worth it. See, I've alluded to the fact that there will be some news we will give out tomorrow morning. And, and I'm a horrible person, so I left it hanging out there and left it at that. Yeah. Hey, I, uh, where, where's Art? I had I had six shots of espresso with Art earlier. I'm not sleeping tonight. I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah, actually, I probably should. Um, we do have two new, new board members. I'm right here, right here. I don't want anybody beating me up. Uh, so we have Ian Masters, who is uh, our vice president. Uh, Kevin Patrick, back there, he's a member of the board. Some of you may not have met Patrick Moore, uh, who's also a member of the board. Forgive anybody, am I, Okay. Uh, that would not go well for me. All right. Uh, so, any any other questions? Yes. You may have touched base at the school The question is: School drop off will it include knives? The language that I have seen on bills floating around in the background indicates probably not. The good news on that, though, is that knives are still defined as deadly weapons in West Virginia as those having blades uh, in excess of two and a half inches or uh, auto, auto knives, you know, click and click. So th this is a deadly weapon, a uh, little short blade like this. 
Not a deadly weapon. Kind of dumb, but hey, it is what it is. Any further questions? Where are we meeting? Uh, where are we meeting tomorrow? That's a pretty good question. Um, eight o'clock, and you may be a little late because I expect lines for the security checkpoints to be fairly long. WVCDL started doing lobby day back in our very beginning, and now everybody and their brother has decided that President's Day is a good day to have their people show up. So tomorrow the veterans will be there, the unions will be there, several other groups will be there. Um, so there may be very long lines at the security checkpoints. Be there early, try and get into the, uh, into the line early. We're, our target is to get started at 8 a.m. Uh, with the, the caveat that it may not happen quite that early. We'll, we'll try. Everything in the legislature happens that way. Everything. It's funny. They've got a judiciary meeting at 9 a.m. Be there on time. 9.45, they gavel in. Uh, it's just the nature of the beast. I think the door's open at, uh, at 8. Something Amber, where are you? The door's open at 8, security gate. So a Amber will find out, let us know. Uh, Oh, Macklin's no. Uh, the, first off, the WV Citizens Defense League does not have a vet. And if they did, it would have a sticker on it. <laughs> uh, Kevin brings up a good point. What to do with your firearm while on the Capitol grounds? It is still illegal to carry a deadly weapon on the grounds of the Capitol, with the following exception. You may store it securely and out of view in your vehicle, thanks to a bill the WBCDL advanced. Uh, so yeah, so now you can do that. If you have a license, that's thank you, sir. That applies if you have a license. If you don't have a concealed handgun license, leave it at home. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to let this news out there. The head of the Capitol Police is not your friend. He'll be polite. He'll be cordial, as I expect all of you to, to be as well with him and his staff. But he is not your friend. If you're found with a firearm in violation of the law on that Capitol grounds, they are going to, you're going to be prosecuted. You are going to jail. So, if you have a license, leave it secure and out of view on Capitol property, which solves a huge logistical issue for so many of us. Uh, yes. Right, she has a very solid point. We are very well respected in that building. And we're respected in that building because we are always models of decent human behavior. I'm going to tell you, there are some anti-gun legislators that will be happy to get in arguments with you. Don't. Just don't. Let them state their opinion if they feel like it, even if it's diametrically opposed to yours. Smile, nod, and walk away. All right? We'll deal with them. Uh, we'll deal with them.
for a reason. If you're tossed out of those galleries, you can bet you'll be tossed out of the WBCDL. And we'll be vocal about it. Um, so, in the galleries, hats off, no flash photography. Uh, and they do introductions, you can clap at that time. Um, generally, other than that, no yelling, no clapping. Uh, it's very quiet. Uh, you just kind of sit there and observe. That, that is the way it works. Now, I'm going to tell you that your presence in the gallery, though, has an enormous impact on those guys. Yeah, but you get legislators that are down on the floor and they look up and see the, all those black shirts. They know what that means. And for those of you who haven't heard it, I'll explain why. There's a principle in political science, a principle of magnification, that for every person that sends an email, you represent 10 people who vote the same way you do, but couldn't have been bothered to send an email. For every person that writes a handwritten letter or makes a phone call, you represent a hundred people that think and vote the same way you do, but couldn't have been bothered to, to uh, make a phone call. Someone who shows up, literally shows up, represents a thousand people who couldn't get the day off work, couldn't be bothered to be there, maybe don't care enough to come down, but in the ballot box will do the same thing you do. This is why your presence at Lobby Day makes such a huge difference. When a lot of these other groups showed up, they're being paid to be there. They, a lot of these groups that show up, and you'll see them tomorrow, they're being paid to be there. They're being offered beer and free rides and everything else to show up up there. The legislators know that you're there because you care. And they know that when you come into that building, you represent a thousand of your friends. And that's why another reason why appropriate decorum matters. Because if you act like a jerk, they assume you represent a thousand jerks. Don't be that. Don't be that guy. Any other questions? Yes, Lewis. Okay, the question was uh, on the definition of secure and out of view. The answer is that is undefined. All right, so the law does not define secure and out of view. Yes, Keith. Guarantee that means your car doors have to be all locked. Guarantee that's the minimum. Keith is an attorney and says that the bare minimum says car doors have to be locked. I am going to maintain that if they don't see it, then it's secure and out of view. Yes. Ladley Field Park. There is in a small auxiliary lot uh, at Ladley Field. I'm going to advise that if you are on the Ladley Field property, you not have any deadly weapons on you. The reason for that is that is a partially partially leased by Kanawha County Schools. Or at least was, and may still be, and I'm going to assume still is. It's possible it's changed hands in the past few years. Shuttle buses. Uh, I take advantage of those shuttle buses when I'm down there on uh, uh, non-lobby day, and buses generally do not run on a government holiday. So it, it, you can make the mistake of standing there at that little bus stop waiting for the capital shuttle bus to come on. And it never comes around. Any further questions? <laughs> yes. Media policy. Um, there will be media there tomorrow. Generally, if the media approaches you, defer them to the board of directors. Start with me. If you can't find me, you know, direct them to uh, Amber or Ian, Kevin, one of the board members. Uh, <coughs> I, I don't know how many of you guys have dealt with the media, but they are very good at verbally moving you into a box where you say something terrible. Something that you don't mean to sound the way it actually sounds in front of the camera after they've packed the 20 words before and the 30 words after, and you've got this little snippet left. 
that paints it like you're some bloodthirsty, ravenous killer. And believe me, if they can do that, they will. Don't let it happen to you. The safest way to do that is to direct them to the board. We're, we're used to dealing with the vultures. Yes? Where? Um, bottom floor of the rotunda, so the ground floor, as you walk in. So if you're walking towards the Capitol, you got these big steps to go up. Not that floor. You have to enter through the wings. There are, on the exterior side of the um, east and west wing, there are signs that say public entrance. When you go through, don't be surprised, there will be magnetometers there. They're going to sweep you. They're going to go through all your stuff. Uh, pocket knives, folding pocket knives under uh, the uh, three inch limit. I said two and a half inches. Three and a half. What, what is it? Somebody, somebody look it up. Three and a half inches. They'll let those go right through in the little basket you put in. They, they will not, yeah, apparently they will not allow mace and pepper spray, etc. And I'm sure they would lock me up if I tried to walk through with this. Uh, so, yeah, that's probably, I'd take a ruler to it, but that's probably safe. So, um, there will be magnetometers. I'll give you guys something kind of funny. Don't run on your way there. I'll tell you why. Now, I don't think any of you have heard this story. I'm not even sure the board's heard this story. I was coming down to meet with a legislator and it was freezing and I didn't have a jacket. So I decided, and the shuttle wasn't around, so I decided to jog from the uh, from Laidley Field all the way across the campus. And once I warmed up, I thought, well, I might be getting ready to start to sweat. I backed off to a walk. Well, apparently, all of that video surveillance had seen me running. And when I got to the magnetometer, I was met with seven armed officers who could not explain to their pal why they were there. So, uh, if you run, apparently it gets attention of the wrong kind. I don't know. I, I just found that to be amusing. Uh, so yeah. doubt if that security presence has anything to do with us. Uh, there are some other groups that are coming down there that uh, they have some concerns about. Uh, so keep in mind that if they're being uh, fairly thorough in the security screenings, Amber's right, that's probably not about you. Uh, all right. So I'll give you guys a general rundown of the way Lobby Day works. We'll all meet at uh, 8 a.m. ground floor under the rotunda. So if you're looking straight up and see a chandelier, you're in the right place. Um, so under the big dome. From there, what we'll do, for those of you who've never been to a Lobby Day before, we break up into groups. We generally do that by Senate district. And we'll call out all the counties in that Senate district and we'll put you in a group. And then depending on who's in that group, we will generally voluntold somebody uh, to lead that group around to uh, all the various legislators that are from those districts. What to expect? A lot of them aren't gonna be home. They're not gonna be in their offices. Some of them will. Most of them will come out and tell you how ragingly pro-gun they are. Some of them will lie really badly about that. Uh, you know, they're known anti-gun and they're telling you how pro-gun they are. Um, you'll see a bunch of that. Uh, but you'll go around, most of them that you will run into will say they're pro-gun and they'll mean it. 
uh, some of them will, you'll see it. Some of them will see you and make a beeline to you uh, because they, they love these black shirts. They know how we work for legislators during campaign season. Uh, so they'll, they'll, they'll seek you out in some cases. Uh, pretty funny, I remember Senator Carnes last year or year before, we marched a group up to his office and he pops open his shirt and like he's Superman and there's one of our logos right there. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see a very mixed reception from these various legislators. Yeah, some of them will be cordial, but you can see the hostility in their eyes. Uh, some will be openly hostile, but most will be, will be very happy to talk to you. And uh, they, they, a lot of them will want to get to know you one on one. Hey, who's where are you from? Uh, you know what? 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 You, they they want to know where you're from in their in their district, and they, they'll they'll get to know you personally. And that's a good thing. Take advantage of that. All of you guys should be on a first name basis with your legislators. If you're not on a first name basis with your legislators, get busy. Get on a first name basis. with them. I, mean, I, I guarantee you, I mean, Danny, when he walks in that building, you know, some of them are going, oh, not him again. And some are, and some are making a beeline to Danny. You know, uh, it's, that's just, that's the way it should be. That, that is living up to Eisenhower's expectations of our involvement in our government. And Danny doesn't have to be his legislator. Yeah, and Danny's case doesn't have to be his legislator. Right? Danny, Danny stirs, stirs the pot every now and then. What cows he for? <laughs> I walked around with him. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other questions for us or any guys lose? Uh, oh, Patrick Morrissey, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, uh, if you guys happen to roll past the Attorney General's office, Feel free to pop your head in there and tell the receptionist thanks. Tell, please tell Patrick thanks. Um, the Attorney General has been a very strong proponent of our rights uh, from the very from before he was elected. And I'm gonna tell you right now that that you talk about the WBCDL's influence on the national level. Oh man, that is happening with Patrick Morris. A lot of folks probably don't know this, but he's been involved in supporting pro-gun litigation. He signed on to a letter that affected Trump's change in the uh, Social Security Administration, stripping people arbitrarily of their gun rights. Um, so, I mean, he's, he's, he's been fighting the fight at the national level for West Virginia. We tend not to publish a lot of that. One, because Patrick's kind of bad about letting us know what he's done. Uh, and number two, we focus so tightly on state issues, sometimes it escapes our notice. I mean, it just simply escapes our notice. But uh, Morrissey has been definitely been fighting the fight for us from day one. Feel free to stop in, poke your head in. You're probably not going to get to talk to Patrick, uh, though you may be walking around and find him make a beeline to you and introduce himself somewhere else in the building. Yeah. I've, I've seen that happen. He'll stop you just because you're wearing a black shirt and talk to him. Uh, but uh, yeah, feel free to stop in and thank him. That that will go a long ways for him. Uh, he, he probably needs to hear it from us. Wes. We'll repeat that a little louder. How many people here attend the state fair?
State Fair. Now I have been to the State Fair and worked it. And let me tell you, the number of people, you remember that principle of three contacts? The number of people you can reach with one contact at that State Fair is unbelievable. Uh, you can have a, you can have five people standing in that booth with a line for each of them trying to figure out who we are and what we do down there. You can be overwhelmed, that booth, and then other times, you know, you got three or four people standing there. But, but I'll tell you, you can reach a lot of people down there. And Wes was putting out the call for women. Because, you know, as I was talking about earlier, women, it's a reality. For other women are a little more disarming. It's not as intimidating for a woman to walk up to another woman and start talking about them. And so, uh, any of you women that can help out at that state fair for a half day, full day, couple days, come down work a shift, whatever, um, it will make a big difference. It'll make a, a huge difference. So spread the word for the women who are not here. I don't see any he mentioned the, the pump, pumpkin festival in Milton. We actually did do a pumpkin festival um, one year. We did that, and it was surprisingly well successful. Last time, we just didn't have anybody volunteer for it. So, congratulations. I will pull up the four miles, brother. I'll drop the Mac McMillan, McMillan rule right on top of your head. He's probably watching the stream and cackling right now. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. So, I didn't uh, PayPal. Yeah, congratulations. We'll, we'll get you some people and some materials for the pumpkin festival next year. Hey, just send it to I, I don't know. I don't know how just many of you guys know the Geralds, but they've been like real strong supporters of ours. Uh, it's one of those. You know, right. I, I focus on the low hanging right. fruit. I'm looking for the clips and cargo pockets. What guy walks by carrying an open carrying a, a 45? I said, so, well, he's got to be a member already. So I call him over and start talking to him. He'd never heard of us. I'll talk to him. I'll lay his field down, hand him some cards, get him some info about the website and the Facebook group. The next day, he comes back for five memberships. One for each member of his family. So uh, pretty awesome. I love it when the WBCDL has to use the front logo on a shirt for the back logo on a toddler shirt. That is awesome. I 